The Dice Tower, Episode 591, Shipping 2019. The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by Renegade Game Studios. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, Mandy and I recap our adventures on a big old ship and talk about what we're excited about in 2019. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. Mandy, how are you feeling? Oh my goodness. Much better than on the cruise. That was brutal. It was great up I until... I felt so bad for you. I felt bad that I couldn't attend the show and some of the other things on the last night. I just... It was rough. My sinuses were bothering me and I felt like I was coming down with a bit of a cold. I'm still a little stuffy now, but yeah, I felt awful about that. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> For those of you listening and aren't aware, Mandy and I are recently back from the Dice Tower Cruise. This beloved podcast, of course, being all about board games and the people who play games. And for some reason, part of that includes going on a big old ship with a bunch of games and a bunch of rad people. And Mandy got super sick and I felt so bad for you, but I'm glad you sound and look delightful yes no so much better that as soon as we started you know i'm like oh we're gonna talk about the cruise i don't know why this popped into my head but the love boat suzanne take it away oh my gosh uh soon we'll be making another run yes <laughs> we now turn into a musical board. oh oh whoa okay we're expecting you okay anyway <laughs> you're the singer mandy i'll leave that to you um but for anybody who, for the vast majority of you that unfortunately weren't able to join us on the cruise, uh, I got to say, this is the second one Mandy and I went on. And it was, again, other than Mandy getting vilely ill, <laughs> oh, so just bad. that little detail. It was awesome. I had such an amazing time. I think, obviously, Mandy, one of our favorite elements was Mandy and I sometimes do live Q&As on the Dice Tower's YouTube channel. And we just hang out. And for whatever reason, one day we're, we said, hey, you know what? Let's put on these fleecy animal onesies that we have called Kigurumi. <laughs> and we did. And I don't know, we had a good time. And somehow somebody on the cruise, I think Jeff, oh, our editor, picked up on it and it kind totally of rallied rough. the troops. And so here we are on the Royal Caribbean Independence of the Sea ship with like 50 people from our group running around in these animal costumes. It was amazing. We only did it for one night and it was just kind of a fun lark. But oh my gosh, it was, I was floored. It was amazing. So anybody who was on the cruise who got the gumption to wear a onesie <laughs> in the, like in the tropics, yeah, the you're amazing. Heat. And thank you. It made me feel awesome to yeah. see you all that way. And if anybody wants to see, we took a picture. I think it ended up being total. There were about 50 people who um, were brave enough to to dress up uh, with the Kigurumis. And I think, I know I posted a picture in the Dice Tower retreat chat. And I think Jeff may have also posted one in Dice Tower as well on Facebook. So if you want to check it out, I have to say everyone was wonderfully dressed. But one stood out, the Cthulhu Kigurumi was oh, ridiculously right. that was intense. good. That was intense. <laughs> I loved it. And so thank you to everybody there. For those of you, um, if you're ever thinking about joining us on the Dice Tower Cruise, I know that a whole stack of games, publishers who sponsored, donated a bunch of games to give away. So everybody who joined got a whole bag, like literally a bag full of games. And there was an amazing photo of almost everybody on the helipad of the cruise ship, which was quite the adventure. It was hot as heck. <laughs> Um, and it was, we filled that helipad. Yeah, we did. It was I thought impressive. I would be easy to pick out. Everyone's like, stand beside Mandy. She's got blue hair. But with the sun, yeah. you it literally just kind of, there was no way you were seeing that at all. <laughs> and uh, my favorite part was there's uh, Jason Levine, who helps organize the whole massive effort of the cruise and does a great job of it. He's yelling instructions, trying to get everybody to 
pay attention to the photographer or whatever. And God bless him. But he's just like, hey, everybody, let's try to pay attention now. And Mandy was having none of it. (laughs) Sam Healy was having none of it. And there's Mandy and Sam just everybody. (laughs) And just, I I honestly, Mandy, I think you terrified the people around you. (laughs) They actually like their faces and they're like, that's rather impressive. I'm like, well, I work with the military and I'm a teacher. You know, y- you learn the voice very early on. <laughs> yeah, I it was it quite the I was impressed too, and I know you pretty well. <laughs> but I know the cruise won't be for everybody, whether it's for financial reasons or you don't want to be on a big old boat going in, in a circle or what have you. But I had a wonderful time. I think they brought an amazing selection of games, some of which we'll talk about today. And think about it. You know, I think a lot of people brought their families and the families got to do all these adventures and excursions. And it really made it um, a well-rounded experience for people who came. They got a wide variety of things to choose from, uh, even though I mostly just wanted to hang out with all the cool people and play games. So no, there were some really great people. We tried to spread out at dinner time. You know, we tried to kind of sit with different people every night, try to get to know some people. And I have to tell people, don't be shy. If you want to come up and talk to me, I know the blue hair is a lot to take in, (laughs) but I always worry that maybe people are nervous. Don't be nervous. I'm nervous too. So always come out, play a game. And I'm sorry that I didn't get to play as many games with people that I wanted to. I know a lot of the games were signed out that we wanted to play, but yeah, anytime you see me, seriously, don't ever, don't ever feel scared. Come just tap me on the shoulder and say, Mandy, do you want to play a game? And I'd be more than happy to do it. She doesn't bite. I, well, yeah, let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's hope not. <laughs> and for those of you who might want to get to know Mandy a little bit better, uh, if you're a loyal podcast listener, one, thank you. We love having you with us. But Mandy, <laughs> you have been a busy lady. It's been intense. So. I know you're referring to my recent foray into the top 100 list. Ta-da! Oh, my goodness. I I won't even... It's amazing. Stop. It's amazing. I was so stressed. I'm being so honest here. Uh, It stressed me right out. And people are like, why are you stressed? I'm like, I don't think people understand how daunting it is. Because, you know, you're always worried. Oh, are people going to say, oh, this list is terrible? Or, like, why would you put that on your list? You know, because people really put a lot of value in these lists. They really want to know what you think. And, you know, that's a lot to live up to. And I wanted to make sure the format was informative for people who were new to gaming, but still entertaining for people who had been gaming for a while, have a few surprises, but obviously games that I like. Like, these are thoughts that go through my head. And for me, I'm a planner. Like, I really like to say, okay, this is how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to be scripted. So I said, let's do something different. So my entire 100 games video is probably about just over an hour. And that's from Mm -hmm. games 100 to number one, but I've split it into two parts. So 100 to 51 and then 52 number one. And the feedback has been phenomenal. I have to say thank you so much to everyone who's taken the time to listen. I know it's a lot of time um, out of your day to listen because they're not short, um, but I appreciate it. And I mean, overall, the uh, comments have been rather positive. People really liked the format. So for those who haven't seen it, I run through the games list, but I give uh, a few lines on the description of the game, how it's played, uh, and then a couple lines about why I like it. And it's kind of like a quick kind of snippet review of the game. So I spend about 30 to 45 seconds per game. So yeah. Yeah, and then I pull videos. Hashtag efficient. Yeah, I'm trying, you know, just try something a little different. And I've pulled some video and footage from other people, properly credited, of course. Um, Tom's in there quite a bit. So, um, yeah, so check it out if you have a chance. If not, that's okay, too. But I just want to say a huge thank you to people who have taken the time to watch it and comment. I see your comments. There's a lot. um, And I'm trying to answer them as best I can. So thank you. Oh, and we've got just... A few we've we've got so many games that we've been playing oh, and we're yeah. I'm super excited to talk about twenty nineteen, but we got some more business to talk about. Oh, oh wait, there there is some business to talk about. <clears throat> so Suzanne, um I finished my top one hundred. Um yeah. Is there something you want to talk about? <laughs> Am I gonna have to call an ambulance for the bus that you're throwing me under right now? Vroom, Amanda vroom. Ann. Vroom vroom. <laughs> you <laughs> Blue-haired villain. (laughs) (laughs) All right. This podcast is over. It's over. Yes, I know. I am years, literally years overdue on my top uh, 50 board game apps. It is something I've actually written it. I actually have the list. I've actually filmed the introductions, um, but my computer died. And so I was struggling with some of that. But I have a brand new computer that we just put together. So I am hoping to do that. 
Mandy very, very soon. <laughs> We're just excited. We're excited. Mm-hmm. Anyway, moving <laughs> along. All right, folks. You heard Tom talk about this last episode. The Dice Tower Kickstarter is well underway. It ends February 7th. And all of us are very conscientious that we don't want to hammer this in. Of course, the Dice Tower is always going to be free. Please download, listen, enjoy. If we ever provide any value or entertainment, you are welcome to it. That said, if you feel like supporting the Dice Tower or you want to pick up some really cool little swag or promos, check it out, please. Um, There are amazing promos that are created by publishers that, of course, you may want to get for your game playing experience. But personally, I'm super excited about these new animal dice characters that we've come up with. There are posters, stickers, there's meeples that I backed for. There's even like a stuffed animal. If you... I know everybody's not into super cute things, but they are adorable. And I love that Tom arranged to have those made. And along with all that, there's Dice Towers, play mats, amazing top line games with promotions, promo cards and things like that that you can get. And, you know, the Dice Tower would continue one way or the other and happily do so. But support from Kickstarter backers helps keep more content going. It helps the team invest in equipment and things like that. In fact, the computer that I am building uh, came thanks to the Dice Tower and Tom helped me build out my computer. And uh, that just means that we can produce more content and try to improve our content for you and try to make it better so that we can all talk about games more and more. So please consider taking a look at the Kickstarter. And of course, if you cannot, no worries. We're glad to have you anytime. Anything you want to add there, Mandy? Yeah, well, I'm just going to kind of go into the next thing. It kind of ties into the Kickstarter, but one of the stretch goals, which we have now since passed, so thank you for that, is uh, a new show that we are, we're looking to do. I don't think we've passed the stretch goal, darling. Have we not? No. Really? We're going to get there. We're going to get there. I have confidence. So wait, so we're not doing this show? Oh, well, that's disappointing. Uh Uh-oh. Well, oh no. Well, I hope we do because we we need, we've been working for a name. I know. We're looking for a name for a show we don't know is going to happen, so I hope it happens. Yeah, I mean, part of getting my computer set up and stuff like that is Mandy and I have a show that we're really excited about focused on live streaming games that we're going to hang out together and play. But because Mandy lives in Canada and I live in the United States, we're not neighbors we're not in the same play group so we're gonna thanks to the the delights of technology we're gonna start live streaming us playing board game apps we're gonna live stream games played on some of the board game sites like yukata and board game arena uh tabletop tabletopia that kind of thing so it, we're gonna have guests on when they're available and we're gonna be talking with you in the chat if you feel like joining us and just hang out and have a lot of fun and One, boy, now that I look at it, I really hope we get to do the show. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) And two, if we do get to do the show, which I have confidence, I have confidence we'll get there, um, we need a name. So, hey, if you have a name suggestion, check it out on the Board Game Geek uh, Guild. We have a thread going on name suggestions, and we welcome your names. There is a little bit of a prize that I put together for the winner. I've created a custom travel roll and write kit for... Anybody who, uh, for the people, person who uh, suggests the winning name, if that happens, I've, you should check out the Roll Right Kit. It's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, but um, we're, we're stretching a little long in this intro. I know everybody's like, talk about the game. Shut up. Keep moving. We're so, almost done. There's just one more thing. One more awesome thing I'm yeah. super excited about. So the big thing now is we have a new sponsor. Yay! Woo! Insert applause here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to USAopoly, who is a wonderful sponsor for a year. Honestly, they were fabulous to us, and we love them dearly. It's just a new year, a new opportunity. And so... Yeah, so now our, our new... So now our new sponsor that we're going to have for the show is Renegade Game Studio. I think this is great for us. I mean, we've done work with them in the past. A lot of you have seen me at conventions helping out uh, at Renegade. So they're definitely someone, a group that we feel comfortable with. So, yeah, so we're really excited to be to be working with them. Yeah, thank you, Renegade, for joining us on this adventure this year. Um, we're super excited. All righty, folks, enough of all of the business and blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about some actual games. So now 
we're ready to talk about games played. I feel like it's been a while since I've done this, so I'm like, oh, let's start off with a fun and exciting one. I hope. (laughs) So the first game I'm going to talk about is Now Boarding, and this is designed by Tim Fowers. Artist is Ryan Goldsberry. Publisher is Fowers Games, and it retails for 44 Canadian and 43 US dollars. So for those who haven't listened to the show before, the prices that I'm using are taken from Board Game Bliss, which can be ordered from internationally or within Canada. That's one we use. And Cool Stuff Inc., which is uh, prices are in American dollars. So now boarding uh, is for two to five players and it plays in about 30 to 60 minutes. So this is a real time cooperative game and you're basically trying to get people to their destinations. You have a fleet of airplanes and you're trying to get people to where they need to go on time. You need to do this before, well, before people get angry. And well, if we've flown and there are delays, we know we get a little angry sometimes. <laughs> so if you end up receiving three complaints throughout the game, well, your airline's out of business. You've just too many complaints, too many angry passengers. So in the game, there's a very nice kind of nice size board. It's not too big, but there you have a board and it has uh, different kind of areas with kind of colored lines that are going to show the different paths you can take to get to different cities. There's a reason for that. You're going to pick an airline and be able to say, oh, if it's purple, my airline's purple. Those are the, the paths that I can travel. Uh, there is a kind of a setup grid of how you're going to set up the game. So basically how many uh, cards are going to come out and for each round, you know, you're going to remove some and depending on player count. And uh, so that chart will help you set that up. The game is played over three stages, morning, afternoon, and evening. And there are multiple rounds within that. Uh, and then from there, you're also going to have little things on the board. Weather, believe it or not. Weather is on the board. So you could have some bad weather. And these are things that are going to make trips longer, potentially uh, more difficult to get to your destination. So these are kind of things incorporated in the setup. Then you have uh, basically, so you fly through that, literally fly your passengers to the different areas, but it's timed. You have 30 seconds to do this. So basically what you can do, I like this part, you can plan, you can sit together. Okay, so you're going to put this passenger here and bring this passenger here because you only have a certain amount of spaces that you can go. When you set up your plane in the beginning, you can have choose an upgrade and it could be holding more passengers. Maybe you can travel more distance. So I think the general is two, but you can up it to three. Uh, and this is important because, you know, you can, if you can only reach one destination, you're not going to be able to pick up as many passengers. So these are things you have to discuss before moving forward. Uh, and then you flip that timer. And if you're playing with more players, it's 30 seconds. Less players, it's 15 seconds. Oh, it's ridiculous it's it's so quick it is so quick so that's what happens in the first phase and then you have uh, another phase uh, which is where you're going to kind of determine okay do I have enough now to get some upgrades on my plane maybe I want to have more seats that sort of thing and then kind of reset up the game again by flipping up the passenger cards that sort of thing so another kind of setup and then after that you determine okay so we might have some angry customers those people who are kind of just sitting there and were not moved to their correct destination or moved at all are going to receive what you call anger cubes so you place these anger cubes on each passenger card that was not flown to their destination if we receive three or more car uh, cards that have complaints bye-bye so that means that game over we did not win Okay, so three complaints were done. I just want anger cubes in real life. I know. (laughs) Just in my pocket. And then if you make me mad, I just get to hand you a cube. And you know. You know what it means. But it's such a hand it. I would literally just just throw it. Just chuck it in. Here's your anger Anger cube. (laughs) Anyway, sorry. (laughs) No, I totally had the same thought. So overall, I played this that time something called board game base camp. So it was it was bordering on a little late you know everyone was a little goofy but and I played with game designers so that always is fun because I always feel hmm are they going to see things that I don't so real-time games are not something that I generally gravitate toward I always feel like it makes me anxious and I'm going to screw it up and ah it's too much stress I this is the kind of game it's like I liked it I did like it and it almost tricked me into liking it because <laughs> and it's a it's not a bad thing. It's the art was really nice. It's it's a it's I retro love Ryan feel. Gold's art. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. I really, really enjoyed the art on this game. The board was clear. So you would think it would be super chaotic with all this, oh, move this here and touch this here. It was still very clear and you could clearly see where things had to go. So that to me, I appreciated that. That was really, really nice. 
the short time element, I have to say, I wasn't as stressed as I thought because you have that period before to where plan. you can plan. So for me, the planning is important and you are allowed to do that. But when that timer turns, get her done. And you only have that time to do it. So for me, I think that's why I enjoyed it. And that's why I said it kind of tricked me into it because I still had my planning element, but then we had to execute it quickly. And there was no time to talk then. So you just had to do it. So that to me was great. I really, really enjoyed it. So I think overall, if you are not into real-time games, this might encourage you to at least try it because you do have that planning time and that makes you feel a bit more comfortable going forward. Um, I know there was an update to the book. So people who had a previous version to the setup, some cards were, I think there were too many cards and they've removed cards, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when you're doing the setup for certain player accounts. So just be aware of that. But um, overall, I like the dramatics of it. And for us, one of the biggest mistakes I think we did, we tried to mitigate too much. Okay, so we sit there analyzing, okay, we're not going to do this one. Okay, let's do this one. Sometimes you just have to do it. And sometimes you're going to have to take the hit. But we were trying so hard not to get anger cubes that when the end came, we just, we we cr literally crashed and burned. Oh! Like, as in, like, that last turn was like, there was just no way we were going to win. It just accumulated into that last, last, last turn. So I think had we just taken the hits early on, it would have been a bit better. We may not have won, but I think that the progress of the game would have been better versus just taking it all at the end. And then you felt like, oh, well, all that hope was just dashed before your eyes. <laughs> so take the hits. It's fun. And you'll have a slightly shorter game. <laughs> so that's now boarding. I think I enjoyed it. As in, I said, <laughs> as in like it tricked me to enjoy it, but in a good way. So that is now boarding and I, I liked it. That's very cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, the next game we're going to talk about is thanks to Mandy because mm. on the cruise, Mandy did a lovely job of teaching me key flow. This is a Richard Breeze game. Ian Vincent and Sebastian Blaisdell are also credited as designers. It has art by Vicki Dalton. And of course it's R and D games as I think pretty much all of Richard's games are. I think um, it retails for $60 in the U S and you know, this is part of Richard Breeze's ongoing key series, Cathedral, Key Flower, Key Purr. Key <laughs> I like that, Key, key Purr, purr yeah. <laughs> and, and now Key Flow. If you're familiar with Key Flower, then Key Flow will feel familiar. If you're familiar, it'll feel familiar. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> of course, not everybody's played Key Flower. So, Keyflow is a drafting game. It is a card-based drafting game in which you're building up a little town. There are essentially three different types of cards. There are uh, resource cards, and they'll give you tokens like tools, or they'll have a picture of a sheep or a cow, some kind of livestock thing or whatever. You don't really interact with them much. They're there, and they kind of sit there for the game once you have them, and they can count for some endgame scoring. Then there are city cards that, and they all connect with roads, which do come into play because you have to transport things. City cards are the cards that really you take actions with. So cards will give you a certain type of resource or they'll let you take an upgrade action or they have a, a, a decent variety of things that you can do with them. But it's mainly about resource collection and conversion. And then there are meeple cards, keeple cards. And these are cards that have one, two, or three meeple images on them. And you will actually, if you draft one of these, you actually play it above one of your city cards, and then you get to take that action. And that's how you do it. One of the neat things about Key Flower and about Key Flow is that you can also take actions leveraging your neighbor's buildings. And so if I draft a Keeple card, I can actually choose, there's little arrows indicating where you can use it. You can actually place it on your neighbor's card to use their action, which is both good and bad because if you play your card on me, it's bad because there's a limit to how many cards can be placed on a city, but it's good because I then at the end of the round get to keep that card, which can help me with end game scoring. I mentioned that there's like movement where you will get resources one place and to upgrade buildings, you have to move them over. So you, there's an action that you can do that. Um, 
And there are four seasons. You basically play through a year. And each season gets the cards advance a little bit. And I think that they're very nicely weighted. So, but that by the time you're into winter, the last phase of the game, all those cards are, are a little more advanced. They're giving you new scoring opportunities, a lot of end game scoring opportunities and that kind of thing. So I think it's very smartly planned out. I really, I, so I played Keyflow three times on the cruise which is incredible, really. <laughs> and then I've played it again since I returned home because I'd already purchased the game. And and I, God bless you, Mandy, for teaching me because I would not want to go through that rule book without that context. So thank you so much. Um, but uh, I really, really enjoyed this game. It is lighter and quicker than Keyflower, which is another game. Keyflower is in my top 50 games. I love it. I think this one is much more approachable, but it still has some complexity. And I will say it is an odd teach. And Mandy, you did a great job of really breaking it down and focusing on the critical things first. And then as we went through the next season, okay, in this season, you're going to start to see this new thing. I thought that was an excellent way of teaching. That's how I did it when I taught it here. Uh, it's a little bit of an odd teach, but I think it's worth it. And... um. The other thing, I think the only other criticism, significant criticism I have of the game is it's fiddly to set up and break down. Yeah. So the individual, you have to separate all the individual seasons cards that are very obvious from each other. But then in each season, there are K cards and player count cards. So you have to count your players and then you have to figure out, okay, which cards do I take out for the number of players we have? And then you have to add in the right number of K cards and then you have to shuffle that deck and you have to do that for each season, except for winter, which you have to shuffle the K cards separately, deal those. Uh, I, I, mm. So anyway, there's, it, it, it is fiddly. If you don't, you don't have to sort it pr appropriately at the end of the game. But then the setup, even when the cards are already sorted, is a little bit fiddly because of that player count thing. Uh, so you might as well take the time at the end of the game to sort it out, but then you have to sort it out all the different decks. I'm making that maybe sound like a big deal. Because I enjoy the game, I don't mind, but I, it's a significant factor. But really, overall, I think Keyflow is an excellent introduction to that world of games because it's pretty straightforward. And I think the art is charming and all the, it, it, really, it's a lovely little package. If you can get over the fiddliness and get through that first play, I think you'll find people really enjoy it. And so Keyflow, in spite of whatever little picks I have about this, the setup and breakdown, Keyflow is a keeper for me right now. I'm really enjoying it. It's a keeper. And that was, no, no, I, that's, ah, <laughs> darn it. Sorry. Can we can we stop recording and let me let me redo that one? Pause. Key, key flow. Key flow is a uh, <laughs> key flow will stay in my collection. Phew. <laughs> fixed it. I know I was giving you an out, but that's OK. Um, key flow is one. I Well, as you know, I really enjoy. I've taught it several times and by teaching it several times, too. I kind of was like, OK, what's the best way to kind of present it? And I do find it's one of those games where if you have someone who's really focused on wanting to strategize and win, then be prepared to pick up the game rather quickly because it's a lot. And it's even for someone who's a gamer, it's a lot of information. You generally have to kind of give it kind of bits and pieces as you go out. So exactly what you said, the main things, the important things. And then as you go from season to season, okay, well, you might see cards like this or like this. You know what I mean? So I think that's, in my opinion, the best way. Sam played it and Sam had not played Keyflower before. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I was curious to see about him, like how he felt about it. Cause a lot of the, the symbols and, and whatnot in the game would be very familiar to people who had, but he, he seemed to pick it up rather quickly and didn't have any issues. So I thought that went over well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for teaching it to me. I, I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. So the next game that I'm going to talk about is fog of love, paranormal romance. Yes, that is the title. <laughs> So uh, there is the base game. This is the expansion. I'll give a brief overview of the base game and then talk about what paranormal romance adds to that. So the designer is uh, Jacob Jaskoff. The artist is Cecily Fossheim and Mike Hojgaard, published by Hush Hush Projects. The base game is $44.95 Canadian and $50 US. And the expansion is fifteen ninety five Canadian, fifteen US. So they have different covers for the game. The male female cover is a, I didn't know this is actually um, exclusive at Walmart. So they have their game, oh. yeah. So I didn't know that. Okay. So they have some exclusive uh, covers there, and then they have same sex covers as well. So 
very fun things that they have. So Fog of Love is a game for two players. Okay, so you basically get to create and play as uh, characters that you create. And basically, you have a very kind of different relationship, and you're trying to make that work. So basically, you're trying to figure out at the end, are you going to stay together? Or are you going to go your separate ways? So throughout the game, you're trying to make decisions that are best for the relationship. And obviously, you want to try and have shared decisions in the game. In the game, you're going to have, um, when it starts, you get to choose characteristic traits of your character so you get five cards and pick which ones you know and some of them are really really fun like bedroom eyes or (laughs) i mean i don't know stuff that someone else might say oh i like that um and then you want to have kind of goals that you're going to have as well and these are things that you keep secret so you have goals and your partner is going to have goals as well and you're trying to increase happiness that's the point of the game So throughout the game, you have uh, these cards, destiny cards, and you're trying to fulfill these destinies as well in order to make sure you and your partner are on the same page. And when you're going through the different cards throughout the game, the different rounds, you'll have choices to make. So you have these uh, poker chips, and they're actually really nice, nice and heavy. And um, they have letters on them, A, B, C, D, E, and the cards will have choices, A, B, C, D, E. And basically, you play a card from your hand. It might have a decision for both of you, just you. And you put these tokens face down. And then you flip them up, and then depending on if it's the same answer, that might give you both more happiness. If you both choose different answers, it may give you less happiness or give you less and your partner more. So it's really cool how these decisions come to play. So the best part is building your character for me personally. I think that's really fun. (laughs) So in the expansion, the paranormal (laughs) romance, in essence, it's you're still playing the same game. But now you're allowed to kind of create your own destiny cards. And these these cards can be used in future games. So in the Paranormal Romance uh, expansion, it's basically divided into two parts. You can't open the second part until you've gone through the first. So it's not quite legacy, but has that feel for like 2.5 seconds because you get to create your own stuff. You don't rip anything up. Um, And basically you, you die. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) that escalated quickly. I know. So in the expansion, it's basically a whole new story. You die, and then your ghosts make these destiny cards that basically regular players could use going forward in other games. Oh. Yeah. So that's that's really it. That's the main change in it. I don't think we took advantage of it a lot in this particular game, but going forward, I could see how when you shuffle it in, that comes up. It's like, ooh, this could be fun. It's just trying to make sure you and your partner are on the same page. That's what makes it difficult. But I thought that was kind of mm-hmm. fun that you can kind of create your own destiny and then, in fact, use it in other games. So I've done a video review of this on another channel, so on my own channel. And um, I actually enjoyed the game. The game is actually quite fun. So the base game on its own. I played uh, with my friend Carol, and she played it with her partner, and she said it wasn't as fun. <laughs> I was like, I, I've heard that. Oh, yeah. She's like, I played with a partner, and it wasn't as fun. I'm like, really? She's like, no, maybe because we were being silly and just, you know, going all out there and, you know, just making up our own storyline versus doing it with your partner. You're maybe sticking a bit more to reality. So huh. I don't know if that's what it was. And she's like, don't get me wrong. It was fine. But it's just I think we were just so out there and making things up and just kind of didn't matter we weren't putting ourselves in a real role. Do you know what I mean? It's something we've made up. So I don't know. I've heard that a couple of times from people. I definitely think in this game, we, in the expansion, we didn't take really advantage of the destiny cards. It was like, okay, we did it. Um, it's something that I think would develop further if you played continually played with the game. So mm-hmm. I think that's the, that's for me, it's like, it's a setup for future games. That's how I felt about that. So Didn't really connect with me in this game, but perhaps future games. So overall, we had a lot of fun with it. I think we played back to back two sessions. You just get to be silly. And I think that's the part. You get to create a character, play that character. So if you like that sort of thing, you'll like this. And it's two player. So it's not like you have a ton of people vying or fighting for certain things. It's two people playing the game, get to the point. You like each other. You don't like each other. You stay together or you don't very straightforward there you go and the tutorial just like real life <laughs> just like real life <laughs> and the tutorial for this game is quite good uh it actually has cards that literally walk you through okay so now you're going to look at this deck and flip this card and tutorial is fantastic really enjoyed it quality of components in this game quite good the expansion really just adds cards in essence to this new game okay so that is a fog of love paranormal romance i'm sure people had an- another way that that might have go but no aliens were involved <laughs> I just really love how they've expanded this concept and that this game has reached 
mass market shelves. Yeah. I think that that's that's wonderful. And um, whether or not the game's for you or not, I I've met the team behind. It. I've never had the opportunity to play Fog of we Love haven't. in any form. Oh my goodness, we no, need to not. play. We so okay. Good. I would play with you. Uh, <laughs> But I've met the publisher and I just really appreciate them as a person. And uh, I'm, I'm, I love this ex- paranormal. I love the expansion. <laughs> that just sounds really cool. But hmm. all righty. Well, I wanted to talk about a little card game called Illusion. This is a Wolfgang Warsh mm-hmm. game. And if you're not familiar with who Wolfgang Warsh is, Besides being a cancer fighting researcher, so he is a game designer who designed Gonshon Clever, who designed Quacks of Quedlinburg, who's designed, who exploded on the scene, who's designed The Mind, mm-hmm. and has really proven to be an interesting and versatile designer that maybe a lot of gaming wasn't aware of up until just a little bit ago. Illusion is a small card game uh, published by NSV. And then in North America, you can get it from Pandasaurus. And because it's just a small game, 15 bucks retail. So it's it's quite approachable and affordable. And, and kind of in that vein of the mind, Illusion is different. So the deck of cards has bands on the back that have a color and a percent. So it may be a red stripe and it has 2% or, and then a green stripe that says 22% and a yellow stripe that says 42% or whatever. And then on the fronts of the cards or I don't know, fronts, backs, whatever, the deck is just full of abstract art essentially, but it's in the same colors, red, yellow, green, blue. And some will be hearts. Some will just be stripes. Some will, it's, it's just a wide visual variety. But the point is, the color. And I will go right out and say, if you are colorblind, I imagine this game is almost impossible for you to play, unfortunately. But for those of you who are not colorblind, the point of the game is an arrow comes up. There's a separate little deck of arrow cards. So maybe it'll be a green arrow. And that says you are trying to build a line of cards focused on the green color. Because what this is, it's kind of like timeline, where you're trying to get cards in a sequential order. If you have the green arrow up, you are trying to play the card that comes up from low to high in the percent of green on the card. So you look at the card that comes up for you. Does that, where does that fit in the row of cards and how much green it has? Does it have more green, less green, that kind of thing. And it is quite difficult. And sometimes it's very, very close. I've had lines where it's 15% and 16%. Oh my goodness. I've played this with adults. I have played this with my children. I've actually played it extensively with my children. And I love it. It's it's delightful. If you like timeline and you're not colorblind, definitely worth taking a look at. It's very teachable. It's a very approachable game. This is the kind of game you could keep in your pocket and teach to a person you just met at at the airport or something like that. It's that simple to understand, but it's super engaging. And some of those decisions feel quite tense. The, the shapes are cleverly abstracted, how you're, you're mentally trying to group a color. Okay. There's all these stripes. Well, if I had them all together, would that be as much as that round circle over there or as much as that pointy triangle over there? And it really works your spatial recognition mind. And, I enjoy that kind of challenge. I love spatial recognition puzzles and that kind of thing. So I think that's another reason why Illusion really appeals to me. So Illusion, another quirky game from Wolfgang Warsh, affordable, interesting, not for the colorblind, but really light, quick, easy to teach, great for kids, great for adults. I I highly recommend it. I enjoy it. So this game actually, Jason is the one who showed me this game first. And this was at uh, a gaming event last year that I went to. So, and I was like, okay, let's check it out. It was a lot of fun, simple, but simple in the fact that it's not hard to, to pick up or to, to teach, but I was, I am surprisingly good at this game. Ooh. <laughs> I know, that doesn't have, we have not played it together. No, which means, no, I can't play it with you. Cause then you're going to crush my spirits and then I'll never play it again. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Well, well, you and I played the mind together when we were waiting at the airport to come home from the cruise. Mandy and I played a quick game of the mind together. No, <laughs> no it was the game. Never mind. Game. Okay, I'm an I idiot. I was like, no, wait, the game. No, the mind. I know. I'm a goof. There's so Sorry. many. Actually, no, I have to say that was a very good cooperative effort. 
that's true. That has nothing to do with illusion or Wolfgang. Sorry, but I digress. We were awesome. We we rocked the game. I know. I just realized I made it sound like you're the most horrible person ever. I just like no. I want to hang on to my victories. You're just so good. You're gonna beat me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Not even. It's a tough puzzle. No, it is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess that's our challenge. When I see it, Dice Tower West, I might have a deck of illusion on All me. All right, yes, we'll give it a go. So moving on now from illusions to creatures. <laughs> Terrible segue. Mm, <laughs> I'm going to call a flag on that segue. <laughs> it's, it's definitely highly questionable. Okay, so the next game on my list is Legendary Creatures. And this is designed by Eduardo Baraf and Christopher Hamm. Artist is Lou Catanzaro, Sebastian Kosner, and Helen Zhu. And the publisher is Pencil First Games. It retails for about 42 Canadian and 36 US dollars. It's uh, two to four players and 60 to 120 minutes. So in Legendary Creatures, you're trying to win the trial and advance to the rank of Druid. So you do this with aid who assist them in their quest for renown. Whatever. I say, Every time somebody uses the word druid, I think of Druidia from Spaceballs, the movie. Do you remember that movie? I do. Druidia. Sorry. That's <laughs> irrelevant. Sorry. I say whatever, because this is a description that is with the game. So basically, whatever form it may take. So they'll take aid from whatever. <laughs> so it's played over three days, so to speak, but each has like an AM and a PM in the turn. Uh, players get to play. You know, you have your little creatures that you're playing with, but you also have creatures in your deck. So everybody has an individual deck that they're going to use throughout the game. And then you have a little setup in front of you, which is, I guess it's called your stable, if I'm not correct, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And these are where you're going to be playing cards that will be actioned from left to right. And then you have another little area, which at the end of the kind of day, you're going to be using those cards to, or end of the round, you're going to be using those cards to kind of see who has the higher value to get some goodies and whatnot. So players take turns selecting the realm they want to travel in. And so on the board, we have, I think it's one, two, three, I'm doing this off to my head here. I think it's four tracks that you want to kind of progress your tokens down. And by progressing them down the end of these realm tracks, you're going to get points. And obviously being first is going to get you the most points to get down to the end of that track. So what you're going to do is once you have these kind of cards that you program, you're also going to have spells that you can use, which are going to add more bonuses. You're trying to acquire different types of, I guess, elements would be the correct form. So you're going to have some fire and some like symbols for, for trees. And uh, these are going to help progress you down these tracks. You also have, um, uh, it's not magic, but it's a type of a, it's escaping my mind at the moment, but you have a purple symbol on the card, which just acts like a type of magic. And this is something else that you can use in the game to help you progress. You're also going to need that in addition to the fire or the forest or whatever else uh, to push forward on the track. Uh, there are parts of the game where you can be kind of mean to people. It's not super mean, but there are cards that can affect other competitors by forcing them to not move in a certain track. Um, and, uh, you know, that definitely can hinder them. You can also, there's an area where you can actually better your card. So even though you have this deck to start, there's an area to say, look, you know what? Actually, no, I'm going to actually swap this card out for one that's that's kind of available for people to take. But they're limited. Um, but they're really great for getting certain types of bonuses. So that's the general gist of the game. I have to say, I didn't know what to take of it at first. When I saw the art and I saw the box, I'm like, oh, the art's really cute. The component pieces are, you know, really good quality. Then I opened it and I looked at the box. I said, oh, this is a 60 to 120 minute game. It legitimately did not look like it would be that type of game by just looking at it. Then you open the rule book. And after you open the rule book and you're just like, oh, wow, there's there, there's a lot happening here. So the setup, OK, that's that's fine. But then when you start playing the game, it's a lot to take in. It's not super simple, so to speak. There's a lot of reading. And don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with reading. But there's a lot of it. And when you're first, it's it's just, it sounds really bad. But when you're first playing the game, you legitimately have to read every single card. So people's turns take a long time. And if you're playing this at full player count, it can drag a little bit, especially if you have someone who's maybe not a fast reader. Someone's like, oh, I need to get some interpretation on this card. Is this what it really means? Like, it's it's a lot. So I think initially going in, a lot of people, and I'm not the first person to say this, how the game is conveyed and how it actually plays are two different things. It looks like it's a short game, and it's not. 
And then on top of that, it just gets very lengthy. It just seems complex for the type of game that it is. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm explaining that properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do like the use of the cards. I like the fact that you can kind of create your deck better and everyone has an equal opportunity to do that. I love the casting of spells like that theme. I love it. I love, love, love that. I just found for me that this is not a game I would recommend playing at high player counts. Mm. It just, it goes on for a little too long for my liking. I played it at two and even with two, and we were, we were going at a fairly good clip through the game. Even at two, it felt like it was like, okay, there was just a lot of complex things that didn't need to be there. So mm-hmm. I had hope for this game because I really liked the theme. I liked the art. I liked the components. I just felt it seemed over complex for what it was. So mm. for me, it's, I don't think this is a game that I would continue to play. I'm glad I had the experience, but I think if there were a few little tweaks, uh, maybe kind of making it not as lengthy, making it less complex. And I have no issues with complexity. Let's make that very clear. Oh no, you don't, <laughs> you know, girl, that. I know that this didn't need to be that. So those are my thoughts sure. on uh, legendary creatures. Okay. Well, I'm going to wrap it up with a lighter game uh, and definitely one that may be harder to get for some of y'all listening. And this is Pongkatsu Factory, published by one of my favorite publishers out of Japan, Itten Games. And Itten Games is the same group that did Tokyo Highway, who recently kickstarted Stonehenge and the Sun. They just do creative innovative, different things, and they do them beautifully. And I'm a fan. So I just want to share that love with you all because I would love to see more of their games become more widely available, like Tokyo Highway has been made through Asmodee. So Pankatsu Factory is designed by Yoshihiko Koriyama, and I have no idea what it costs. I got this for Tokyo Game Market, and it... it between the extra shipping from Asia and all this other stuff, it it certainly <laughs> blows the price up yep. quite high. But um, I'm hoping somebody picks this one up because it's it's super duper fun. And it's interesting to me that a publisher out of Japan creates an English language word mm. game. I always think that that's super fascinating. Uh, Punkatsu Factory is a word game, which I know doesn't always p- appeal to a lot of people. And it has a race element, which I also know (laughs) doesn't appeal to a lot of people. Please stick with me. (laughs) Hang in there. So Punkatsu Factory is a four-letter word game. Not that type of four-letter word. Any (laughs) four-letter word that you get. And basically, everybody gets a set of vowels, A-E-I-O-U, in a unique color. So that's your player color. And it helps distinguish tiles later when you have to separate them out. And you get a player shield because your word formation is secret. You're going to randomly draw a certain number of tiles, like I think 15 tiles. And then with all the 20 tiles that you have, you're behind your player shield. You have to create three, four letter words, just different ones. It could be then sat, not sat, said, um, oh, wow, that was embarrassing. Anyway, Delete. whatever four letter words. Oh, yeah. Rewind. <laughs> um, whatever four letter word, it can be more sand. It can be more advanced or whatever. Just any four-letter word. And then when everybody's done, you take just the tiles that were used to form those words. All the other tiles get discarded. You mix them all up, and then you hand them to the player to your side. And then that's where the race element comes in. Now, with the new set of tiles that you know creates four-letter words, you have to scramble to recreate three four-letter words out of just the tiles you've received from your opponent. And... As soon as you complete it, you grab a marker and it that's the race element. Whoever completes first gets a higher number of points. Whoever completes last gets a lower number of points. But if you manage to create the same word or words that your opponent created when they handed it to them, you get bonus points. Mm. So it's this interesting thing of well, what words it, it's it's just interesting. And then there's this reveal because you write down the words that you actually originally wrote. So then there's always this reveal. Well, here's the words I created. Are those the words that you did yourself? And honestly, most often it's no. It's fascinating how a block of 12 letters can create such a variety of words in different ways. But then when it is Even if you get just one right, there's this elation. There's, yeah, you're like, you're so excited that you managed to match this word and get that single bonus point. Um, I would have been in a game where somebody got all three words and it was jaw drop. Whoa, that's amazing. (laughs) And 
it's just, it's simple. I think the four, the restriction to four letters actually eliminates one of the challenges a lot of people have with word games, which is that vocabulary issue. They with the most vocabulary wins, right? Well, that's not necessarily the case in Plakats and Factory. Four letter words are, a lot of people know four letter <laughs> words. And um, it's it's interactive. The letter tiles uh, some of them, we occasionally have a little bit of an issue with a couple of them where if you flip the tile, is that an M or is that a W? Right. But there is a line on the bottom. You just have to know that there's a line at the bottom that clearly indicates the bottom of the letter. But the tile letters have a cool typeface treatment to them. So they're pretty, even though it's just letter tiles, it looks cool. Uh, it's quick. It's easy to teach. It definitely is a party game, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's another beautiful production, an interesting little word game party game. I am a big fan. I it's the kind of thing I kind of am tempted to just carry it with me, but I don't want to lose it by accident. <laughs> but uh, that's Punkatsu Factory, and I hope that someday we'll all have easier access to it. I would love to. I love word games. So I mean, and my mom, of course, she beats me every time. So here's another one. Maybe I might actually win against her. So yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Hopefully in North America soon. Alrighty, let's go back in time. Visit some good old shelf staples. Gotta go back in time. Back oh in gosh. time. Hey, y'all, the folks at Renegade want you to know that Rake Holt by Uwe Rosenberg releases in North America on February 6th. You know, I love me some Uwe, and Rake Holt is a delight. So check it out. Let's discuss those previously discovered board game gems in Shelf Staple. I feel like it's been a while since we've done a Shelf Staple, and I'm like, hey, you know what? It's time to pull something off the shelf that, uh, you know, hadn't played in a while. So, oldie but a goodie, I decided to talk about Istanbul. And this is designed by Rudiger Dorn. Artist is Andreas Resch, Hans George Schneider, and the publisher is Pegasus Spiel. And this retail is Istanbul that old? It's well, 2014 is not old. Oh, wow. Like 2014. No, I, uh, time I mean, flies. Wow. So, yeah. So when I say old, like just so for people who have not heard that, it's just basically not something that was released within the past year or two. So I try to get a five year mark or four year mark. So yeah, I know. I thought it was newer than that myself, but there you go. 2014. So it plays uh, two to five players and it plays in about 40 to 60 minutes. So Istanbul is a worker placement game. And players are merchants and you're traveling through the city of Istanbul and you have assistants and they're basically going to help you get things. So they're doing some deals, transactions, and what you're trying to do in the game is to be the first to acquire five gems. So I say the first, but other people can do it too. And then there are ways to figure out who wins, but you want to collect five or more depending on the situation. So the workers are kind of stacked under your merchant token. And when you move your merchant, then basically you're dropping off assistant discs at locations because they have these little locations on the board uh, that are the board. So they're all separate. And uh, basically you're trying to navigate through the city the most efficient way as possible. So you're not having to use up all your assistant and maybe you just might not have enough to get there. And basically trying to get these rubies by going through these locations. Sometimes you can buy them with money. Sometimes it's, you got to pay in resources. So these are ways to kind of acquire those things. So this is the type of game. It's simple enough, but there's still enough strategy. As someone who's an advanced player would say, okay, maybe I want to do it this way. Or, you know, I want to try and go this way. Or I mean, you can definitely choose a path. And I, I like that. And either one is still a good way to victory. So I like the fact that you can play with a variety of people. I used to play this, believe it or not, during my lunch hour as a two player game which does change it up a little bit um, to learn when I was learning French with my colleague who uh, is French speaking. And then, um, so I would give her the English rules because she wanted to brush up on her English and I would take the French rules and we kind of play together. So it was a lot of fun. So Istanbul, love, love, love. It's been around for a little while. I think this is one that a lot of people already have on their shelves, but if you don't, you should definitely check it out. I, this is why we're friends, Mandy. For <laughs> as much guff as we give each other, <laughs> You do have pretty good taste in games, oh, I must admit. Thank you, so do you. And Istanbul is one of my all-time favorites. Um, so I love that you brought this up. Yay. That's I just didn't realize it was five years old already. That's amazing. When you said that, I was like, is it not old enough? <laughs> no, it, it is. And, you know, I, I never, especially even on the cruise or on the guild or on social media, I interact with so many people who, hey, I just got into gaming a year ago. I just yeah. got into gaming two years ago. Right. Well, this game came out way before 
Yeah. They joined. So it's completely reasonable that games that are even five years old, and that's why we have this segment, are new to somebody. And I actually think that's pretty magical. Awesome. So I want to go back to 2012, oh a little bit older, <laughs> to Maharani. This is from Queen Games, and it's designed by Wolfgang Ponning, Marco Fielder, and Klaus Stefan. Wait a minute. It's designed by Wolfgang Ponning, and the artists are Marco Fielder and Klaus Stefan. <laughs> You know, details, mere details. Now, it retails for $55. I will tell you, Maharani is a game that you can find on sale a lot of places. Okay. And I doubt that you would, I think you could find it for significantly less than what standard retail price is. Just going to toss that out there. Okay. And that is good news because it's a good game. I really enjoy it. Maharani is a tile laying game. And what you've got, it's interesting because Achael, the Tetris-like game Uh from Mebo Games recently, they had a disc in the center where you put tiles and it spins around. Well, Maharani, years years before Achael, has a disc that you put the tiles on that spins around. (laughs) Go figure. So you put tiles on this and then you select a tile from the disc to place into the board. And where the tile is on the disc, if you take the tile from the the disc and it goes into the quadrant that it's next to, then that's easier, that kind of thing. There's a little token set that you have that lets you break that rule, but um, predicting how that turnstile is going to go and things like that, that's a, a, a nifty little part of the game. Now, these tiles are in different colors and... That's important. They also have little circles or half circles on them. And those are represent building pillars. And those are actually very important because the board itself in these quadrants is printed with pillars. And when you place a tile, the pillars must align as well. So not only are you looking for a tile that is in the right quadrant, that is in a color that you want, because if you can build up sections of color, That will score you some additional points. Um, You also have to match up these pillars. So there's a little bit of tricksiness in that. When a quadrant is full, you're going to score it. So there's multiple scoring rounds. And that matters in part because as you build up a little troop um, or a little group of tiles that are the same color, you're going to be putting meeples on them that represent your color. But they stay there until the section is scored. And you're placing all over the board. But majority for meeples in an area counts for points. You score points as you create larger color groupings, all that kind of thing. And sometimes you're like, oh, crud, I really need some meeples back. And so then all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm going to try to force scoring on this quadrant just so I can get some movers back. Um, Overall, it's a very straightforward game. The components are fine. The art is fine. But I really like it. I think it stands up to newer gameplay standards for tile lane, that extra little complexity with the pillars, that planning. You can definitely argue that there's randomness in it since the tiles come out of a bag and go on the disc. But to me, that's part of the appeal of the game. That's part of the challenge of the game is being able to work with what you get, plan ahead, a few turns ahead and what you get and that kind of thing. I do want to say that I learned this game relatively recently from a dice tower listener and and viewer tracy who um i met up with at pax and we were talking about what game we wanted to play and based on my tasting games tracy picked maharani to teach me which was a delight and tracy and her partner and i got to play maharani and i instantly was like this game is wonderful and they're like great here you can keep the copy we just played i was like what that's amazing that's so nice and so that's the copy I have. And the, they even told me, check it out online. Don't worry. It's not, we just bought them on sale and it's <laughs> relatively expensive. But there you go. Maharani, definitely a queen game worth looking at. And I guess just because of the idiosyncrasies of the industry, one that you could probably get for not too much money as well. If you like tile lane um, and randomization mitigation, that kind of thing, it is a good one. Yeah, definitely one. I'm, I'm making my list for all these games that I haven't played. So that's one I've not played. I would definitely, now I feel I need to check it out. And before I forget, I should have mentioned this. Istanbul, I think there's a big box or it's coming or it's in the top. I think it's coming. Yeah. yeah. So there, yeah. if someone, if you don't have it, or maybe you have it and you want to try and get some other things, um, they are coming out with a big box, which is going to incorporate Istanbul and then a few of the expansions. 
Alrighty. Well, folks, we thought it would be fun. Here we are at the beginning of the year, and we already know that great games are going to come out. And there are a ton of great games that we don't even know about for sure. But, Mandy, I thought it'd be fun to hear a little bit about what you are looking forward to seeing in the upcoming year. This is exciting stuff. I feel like we need to like do some like air guitar here. First impressions rundown. Okay. So normally here we have a Q&A or victory point segment. Well, and because we are procrastinators, that didn't happen this week. So we we're just, not procrastinators. It's been busy. Well, that's true. It has been busy traveling. Also, we're sick. procrastinators. And yeah, we're also procrastinators. So we thought, hey, let's do something else that's fun. And we're going to kind of do a first impressions rundown. We're basically just talk about games that we're looking forward to seeing in 2019. So I hope everyone's okay with that. And you can kind of have your own list and be like, hell yeah, that's on my list too. And, you know, we can chat and compare. So we're not going to go into too much detail, but just to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking for. So the first one on my list is On Mars. And don't even say it. I know what you're all thinking. Don't say it. (laughs) Space game, Mandy. (laughs) You know, I can never say that I don't like space games. You really can't. I can't at this point. In fact, it's not a matter of you being able, like, it's not just you stopping saying, oh, I don't really like space games. You really do have to make the pivot to... I'm a fan of space games. <laughs> I really do. I, I just can't say yet. I'm not ready. That'll be the next step. Okay. Progress. So, <laughs> so On Mars is uh, uh, designed by one of my favorite designers, uh, Vital Lacerda. And the artist is done by another favorite artist, Ian O'Toole. And it's going to be published by Eagle Griffin. So yes, space theming. I looked at the intensity of this game. So basically the weight. And it is on BGG at a 4.33 out of 5. So I'm like, ooh. That's, whoa. That's intense. So I got to say, though, it kind of piqued my interest. Like, what are we talking about here? But I'm looking and it's got economic elements. It's some farming because, well, you know, I like the farming thing happening there. Industry, manufacturing, city building, area control, hand. Like, it just has so many things that are appealing to me, whether it's space or not. It's like, hey, I'm all interested to check it out. So... You know, they talk about building buildings, um, rovers or ships, producing, buying or selling resources. I mean, these are all things that speak to me anyway. I'm just curious to see Vital's take on it. And some of the components look really cute and really nicely well, uh, nicely done. So very much looking forward to this one. That's awesome. And I, along that lines, I also know uh, Ian O'Toole and Vital are partnering up again with Eagle Griffin on Escape Plan. Right. Which is basically an after the heist game it's a post heist heist game Mm -hmm. where you're part of a criminal group that did a big heist and now you're in hiding but now you have to rush and get to the loot to get out of town before you're all caught so it's kind of this competition to get to the loot that you hid with your compatriots it's not cooperative anyway avoid the cops kind of leverage whatever you can to get out of town um and again, it, it's it's Vital, so it's typically a little bit heavier, but not any 4.829, whatever that was. <laughs> Holy cow. I'm but curious. As you're talking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it I, up. I like the theme. I think the theme is super cool. I think because uh, it's in, the art looks amazing. It just looks super stylish. So I'm super excited to check this one out. Yeah, so and this that's one's also escape on, plan. This one's also on my list. And <laughs> you'll be happy to know it's a 3.88. So. Oh, phew. Practically light. <laughs> practically <laughs> light. Exactly. So the next one on my list is Sorcerer. So I I feel like I'm delving kind of all over the place with this one. But um, Sorcerer is one that I believe, was this on Kickstarter? I believe it was. Yeah. yeah. And this is a white wizard game. So this is designed by Peter Schultz. Uh, mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I generally tend to like a lot of white wizard games like Hero Realms and Star Realms. But this just seemed to have kind of a bit of all those things, but a bigger game. So I love the fantasy type theme to it. I mean... For those who don't know, or maybe you... It's dark fantasy. But, and that's Let's why be clear. I like it. No, and well, of course, exactly you would. It. Well, of course I do. That's I'm so predictable. But yes, that dark fantasy, the color, just everything was like, ooh, I like where this is going. And then it, it's a strategic type card game. So I'm like, okay, let's give this a go. Uh, so just based on that, I really liked it. And now this is a game where now, yes, they have dice. And oddly enough, I like Euros and worker placement, that sort of thing. But I, I also really like dice element in certain games. And I feel like it would work well here. So mm-hmm. I do like the kind of story-driven deck build Building. Deck building is not a thing for me, but I like the fact that it's a story-driven deck builder. So I won't go into too much detail on it, but Sorcerer is one that I'm actually quite looking forward to. So I got to play this in prototype form. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to it as well. It didn't make my 
list, but I think sure. that's, I, I think it's a an interesting thing because we're in a very lucky position that we get to play things early, whether it's we're at a convention and we get to play test something or uh, we go to Essen. And so titles that are available in Europe, um, I, I'm they're, they're being released in North America for the first time. So for example, Blackout, yeah. Hong Kong, it has a, it's a 2018 North America release, but it was a 2018 European release, that right. kind of thing. Right. We've played Blackout. I've played like Yentus, which would be on my list if I hadn't played it. Pistali would be on my list if I hadn't played it, that kind of thing. Um, and so Sorcerer is one of those situations where I've had the benefit of playing it and I thought it was very clever. There's so much variety in the different faction decks and stuff like that. It's going to be, I'm looking forward to it. And the action point, the way you take your actions is cool too and stuff like that. I'm looking forward to it yeah, too. I'm excited. Um, and, Along that line, there are other games I'm looking forward to that I've played and some that I haven't. I've got to say 2018 was an amazing year for Roll and Write games. You knew, <laughs> y'all, you knew you weren't going to get away from this podcast without me talking about Roll and Write. Right. Um, <laughs> and honestly, I, I don't think, I think 2019 is going to be another big year for it. Maybe 2020, people will ease back a little bit. They'll downshift in production this year. But 2019, whew, they're going to go strong. Yeah. So not only do we have kind of my beloved abstract ones from Europe, like Doppel, um, Dopplet and Doppel, Gonshon Clever and Dizzle, Hex Roller, that kind of thing. Other groups are getting into it. So first of all, Mandy, you'll remember Welcome to Dino World. Oh, yes. It's being sure. published. I'm super excited oh, to see that fantastic. in a published version on tours one that was on kickstarter that i've been keeping my eye on i wanted gorgeous. to back that one but the price was just it was pricey because they have uh dry race sports foldable dry race sports yeah, i wish they'd done pads instead but yeah um i backed it so i'm looking forward to oh that. lucky you uh, well i had to i know and then an interesting direction that some publishers are going into role player adventures. Now I'm not sure that this is a roll and write game, but it's listed as a pen and paper style game. So role player from Thunderworks, right? So now they have yeah. role player adventures. It's listed as a pen and pencil game coming out in 2019. Interesting. I am intrigued. Oh, I am too. interested. Yeah. And literally an hour before we started recording this podcast, I saw the press release from Portal Games that Ignasi has done Imperial Settlers, the roll and write game. Can you believe I've never played Imperial Settlers? Oh, I would love to teach you. It's yeah. one of my favorites. Okay. I really like Imperial okay. Settlers. Okay. And that's my point. I really like Imperial Settlers. And what, what? Like Imperial <laughs> Settlers, the roll and write game? I'm stoked. I still am in absolute love with this format for games. I think that there's a beautiful amount of diversity and variety in mechanisms and theme and approach that I find engaging. So 2019, I'm all about the roll and rights again. Nothing wrong with that. Hey, it just shows you're consistent and keep it strong. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one on my list, we're going to swing over from light and fun and dicey to just more heaviness. <laughs> so I have Barrage on my list. And this is uh, designed by T Tommaso Battista and Simone Luciani. And it's published by Cranio Creations. And this, we're looking at a complexity weight of about 3.92 out of 5 on, on BGG. So it is definitely on the weightator side. We saw this at Essen. We didn't really have a... a I, mean, I don't think it was it out way. or available. It was just kind of a walk by. Ooh, this looks great. And didn't really have much time to kind of take a look at it, but I mean, it has a lot of the things I like. It's a, so it is a strategy type game, economic, environmental, so industry, manufacturing, uh, worker placement. I mean, as you know, I like my, my worker placement. So a lot of re like resource management, that sort of thing. Um, I know that I heard people talking about mechanisms in this game being a bit more challenging. So it's definitely something I want to 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 look at more closely. Like I said, there wasn't a lot of information at the time, but it is one that I'm I'm very interested in in checking out further. Sure. Another great continuing movement in games from my perspective is the growth of the solo game territory. Renegade Games announced that they have a solo game, started a series basically of solo games that are going to be released. Um, and then uh, I was ecstatic to see that Z-Man announced a new game in the Oniverse line, Arian. So this is on Onirim and Castellian and things like that. These are technically they're one to two player cooperative games, but really I play them exclusively solo and I love them. <laughs> and it, I love the art style in these games. I know some people, <clears throat> Tom does not, <laughs> but 
I love the art style. I think they're beautiful. I really enjoy the whole series, um, especially Natillion and Nyrim. I think they're just fabulous. And Arian looks like it's a little more in the vein of Natillion. I'm not really sure, but it's got dice involved, and that's partly what, what I'm doing. And it's all about building an airship. So super cool theme. I'm in. Right. And another one that I was really happy to hear about that I'm ex- really excited for is Maki. Hmm. Now, Maki has been a print at home solo game for quite a while. And it finally got picked up for kind of a general publication. And I am so happy about this. It also has an iOS app version that plays quite nicely, which if you wanted to try McKee today, you could if you have an iOS device. McKee is a solo worker placement game. Mm. Ta-da! Okay, I think that that instantly is intriguing and interesting. And it plays quite well it is challenging it takes place in in the war and you're scouting out you're trying to get communications tower you're you're gathering resources you're trying to avoid the troops the guards that are moving around the board as well so they block off areas so you have to plan your your routes very well that kind of thing um events happen all this other things mckee i've had a lot of pleasure playing this solo and i'm really excited to get a nice finished production copy of it so if you solo game uh at all and you like that you know war gamers have solo gamed for years and years and years and years but if you want a lighter quicker solo game experience this will be a good year for us oh i'm interested to try it i'm not a solo gamer but there have been a few like caverna i've done solo i think i I think i cheat accidentally maybe that's why but (laughs) i I can't help it's not a purpose but i'm I'm always looking to try different things so i mean hey this might for you know for me into that kind of solo gaming yeah so the next game on my list is Pipeline. And I know that I, was this another Kickstarter? I feel like it may have been. I think so. Yeah. So it's what I've heard people talk about. So this one is uh, designed by Ryan Courtney, art again, uh, you know, tool, which does some good stuff and publishers capstone games. And this is a kind of economic type game, root building tile placement. I looked at it and I instantly thought of tramways. So I don't know if anyone's played Tramways. Tramways is mm-hmm. a brain burner. Oh my goodness. Your mm-hmm. brain is like putty in your hands, but it's so good. So I'm like, is this something very similar, you know, kind of building this kind of network to try and basically get your passengers to the right place. And I feel like it, it has that. It might have a slightly different system um, the way it's done. It, 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 hence, it could be a totally different game. It just, when I look at it, that's what I get. Sure. And hey, I'm totally okay with that because I do like that economic in games, economic vibe to a game and, you know, that kind of networking. So Pipeline is one I'm actually very interested in trying out. I know a lot of people have spoken very highly about it. And for those who don't know, it is on the weightier side at about a 3.86 out of 5 on BGG. Cool. I I think you may have gotten to see this too at PAX you Mandy I'm not quite sure but Oceans yes is definitely on my list that, from North Star Games that looks great if you're not familiar with the title I mean to be fair it's kind of a generic name Oceans right. but if that doesn't ring a bell maybe Evolution would yeah. so this is the aquatic take the aquatic evolution of evolution. I'm sorry. I'm really bad with wordplay, people. I apologize for that. That was awful. It's okay, we'll let it slide. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your graciousness. Um, Oceans is that aquatic version. And it's not just evolution in the sea, although that's part of it. So if you love evolution, I think you'll instantly be interested in Oceans. They've definitely tweaked some of the mechanisms um, as well. I think they've taken things that people really enjoyed and amped it up. And, and, and beyond that... They've got that darn art, that amazing watercolor art. And it it was beautiful with dinosaurs and birds and things like that. But when you think about the ocean and the fluidity of water and the the vibrancy of the life of sea life, and then you put that watercolor style on top of it, that fantastic. Oh, my gosh. It's mind blowingly cool. So oceans, I so excited for it yeah it's definitely one that um, uh, it's not I hadn't written it here, but it is one that I looked at that looked quite good. So excited for that one as well. So the next one on my list was one I think I found. I was doing a search, actually, on BGG, and I just plopped into my lap. And I'm like, ooh, this looks fun. And the name of this game is uh, Brazil. And it's not uh, Brazil with a Z, and then you say it with an S. It actually is spelled Brazil, so B-R-A-S-I-L, if you are looking for it. And this is... um, 
published by What's Your Game. So they've done other ones like a uh, Nippon Signori. Mm-hmm. There's been a few. This mm-hmm. again is on the Vasco weightier. Gama. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is on the weightier side. You're looking at about a four out of five on BGG. Uh, and again, it has that economic element. Press your luck, which is something I kind of like in games. And it's just interested to see it in this type of game. Variable player powers, worker placement. So again, I'm starting to sound very predictable, but <laughs> type of game that I you know like. And it's about gold mining in the 18th century. So I'm very curious to see how they play on that. And I mean, obviously wealth comes into play and I'm just curious to see if they bring in any kind of historical elements or it's just based on just that. So it sounds interesting. I know I'm not giving a ton of information because we've got a few games we're going to go through, but Brazil is one that I'm very much looking forward to trying. Cool. Now this one's interesting or at least to me because this is an old game, (laughs) but I I had to mention it in 2019 because Forense is getting a Mm, reprint. I saw that. And I... I am lucky to still have my copy of Forense and I've been hoping that it would get reprinted. And sure enough, the vassal law of gaming, if a game is good enough, it'll get a reprint has come into play because nice. Forense got a reprint. Um, just like we're talking about shelf staple. A lot of people haven't been playing games quite as long, so they might not have had access to Forense and that's too bad because it is a wonderful Euro game. It is highly interactive and can be a little bit mean. So it might not be for everybody, but a lot of people complain, well, Euros have no interaction. Well, Forense breaks that rule right down. (laughs) Um, And you've got these cards that you're getting and you're trying to build up these towers and you get these little stackable brick pieces, but the brick pieces are also kind of a currency and balancing that out, that kind of thing. You have limit all this other stuff. Uh, And you get these cards and bricks through this market, but maybe a card has the perfect bricks that you absolutely need, but the card actually does something bad because not all cards are good and maybe you can't afford the really good one down the line. Oh my goodness. There's so much going on. It is I've, I've loved this game for a long time. If you can take just a little bit of interaction in your Euro and you've not had a chance, Forense is a 2019 reprint, but one that, even though I have it, I'm super excited about it. So believe it or not, I haven't played this. There's so I many. It. I mean, it's a lot. It's hard to keep up with everything. It's just, yeah, it's it's there. It's so many things. I don't own it, but I have friends who have it. We keep trying to get it out and it's just, you know, other things take are taking precedence. So definitely one I would like to try. So I'm glad they're doing a reprint. So the next on my list should not be a surprise to anyone who knows what games I like or if you've watched my top 100 lately, but uh, <laughs> Food Chain Magnate, the ketchup mechanism and other ideas. <laughs> I know. Oh, the, that pun. I know, but it's so good. So I've actually been on the site to look for a description. It actually doesn't give a ton on here, but if you've played uh, the game, Food Chain Manor, it's basically it's an expansion for it. And I think, I don't know if it's just looking at expanding the types of, of uh, restaurants or types of things that you're, you're building, or maybe it's the different types of marketing. I'm not sure, but I have a feeling it's just going to expand on what's already there, potentially providing you with other types of ways to, you know, to make your, your restaurants even more amazing or just different types of restaurants that will bring in that revenue. So I don't have a, an exact description. I'm just going off what's on the site. It's not a ton, but I love the original game. So I, it's just one I'm thinking I want to pull in to try out that's very very cool and honestly mandy expansions were on my interest list too i will be very transparent i am not usually i found for a variety of reasons just keeping up on expansions is is difficult and it's just not something that i ended up prioritizing a lot but to that end um i saw that some expansions for some games that i absolutely love are coming out so i'm Mm. pretty sure those are going to go my list uh first of all heaven and ale Yes, love that game. Which, oh, right? It's so good. So good. I love Heaven and Ale so much. That has an expansion coming out. Gotta get that one. Mm-hmm. Quacksalber. Yep, another good one. Quacksalber de Quedlinburg or <laughs> the Quacks of Quedlinburg has an expansion, The Witches, mm-hmm. which looks, I mean, more more potion ingredients, more Quacksalber just has to happen. And I think it expands it to another player, which is great. All right. Um, so those are definitely two expansions on my list as well. The other one that's super cool that I'm excited about is Time Stories. I mean, sure, there's a lot of Time Stories. Why are you so excited about? Well, I didn't know that Time Stories was coming to a end of sorts. Mm. So they announced the last game in the White Box series. Right. Madame <laughs> will be coming, ah. which I'm excited for. Great. I, I love me some Time Stories. But then they said, then they're going to start the blue series. And my, I went, what? <laughs> Just like that, what? right? Blue? What? Blue? What? <laughs> I, I was surprised. I am so excited to know that they're 
starting a new series, the blue box series or whatever it's going to, whatever blue means. Um, if nothing else, I think it gives them an opportunity. I'm hoping that they took it, look at their formula, they tweak it a little bit, they freshen it up. Um, and it gives us a whole new way to experience this really cool concept. So expansions, I'm in for 2019 more than, more than some years. I think, I think 2019 will be an expansion year for me. Yeah, I think I, me too. Like you named some ones that I'd definitely be interested in trying out. Cause I, I, I just never get to them a lot of the time. Just yeah, it's hard. Many games. Yeah. Yep. So the next on my list, I'm actually going to kind of group these are different games, but again, done by the same, same designer. So I know uh, Vital Lacerda, I swear it's going to, it's an obsession. Apparently at this Vital point. is all over this list. I just realized that. No, like crazy much. So, so this first Yoinks. game I'm going to talk about is Mercato. And this one here is a, it was an interesting description. Ooh, I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. No, and I didn't know it either until I pulled it. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Abstract strategy, economic. It's a area control and tile placement. So I thought, oh, this is definitely something I think Suzanne would be interested in. And mm-hmm. uh, it's a filler. It's, it's, it's a really short uh, time to play. I think it's 15 to 30 minutes. And basically, you're trying to buy boosts in a market, open new businesses, and influence them and attract clients to them. That's really the gist of it. And it is a tile placement game based on Lisboa City building system. Oh, my gosh. I... Well, I want to add, I'm adding this to my list. Right? I had no, I had not seen anything about it, Mandy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm in. It's like, oh, thank, this looks awesome. thank you, Vitel. Because <laughs> I swear, I just look at his name. I'm like, yep, 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 yep. So that one just stood out to me. And I was like, that sounds interesting. It's a filler, but so what? I mean, we can't play, I can't play all heavy games as much as I love it. It's nice to have a little variety. So I'm looking forward to that. And then something else that he's doing, and I think it's finished on Kickstarter now. I mentioned it on a previous podcast. I won't go into much detail, but Railways of Portugal. So this is the expansion to, um, what's the original? Uh, I can't talk. My brain is uh like railways yeah, I mean, of the world. Thank you. Railways of the world. But that's not the one I'm actually going to get. I'll probably get the railways of Nippon because you can mix it also with railways of Portugal. I like the elements that are added in there. So that's another one that I believe Vital is doing. So, yes, he is all of his list. And I'm more than happy to uh, take a look at more of his games. Hmm. I'm lucky in Seattle that we have a really vibrant game design community. And so I got to get a sneak peek super prototype form of fantastic factory. And it's definitely, even though I got to try it, I only, I didn't play a whole game or whatever. Um, It's, it's on my anticipated list because it is, I love dice allocation games and this has that, and you're building up your little factory. The art is fantastic. I fantastic factories has fantastic art. (laughs) Um, You're on a roll today, Suzanne. <laughs> I know. I'm just terrible at this stuff. It, it's really, it's really delightful. I liked the dice placement. I liked the mitigation. I liked the way you're building up your factory and how that all worked together. It was clever. It was approachable. Um, it was pretty. So I am excited for Fantastic Factories. And I think you were talking about this one too, weren't you? It's one, it's on my list. It's one that I had seen before and I'm like, oh, it looks really cute. I didn't know much about it, but then I heard some really good things about it. And I think it's rated relatively positively on, um, on BGG. So it's definitely one I'm interested in trying. Yeah. It's, it's definitely um, lighter and, and just it, I think it just is smooth. And that's what I, one of the things I like. Yeah. So the next I have on my list is Tales of Evil. This kind of comes out of nowhere. Oh, that sounds like your kind of game. <laughs> Doesn't it, though? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I love it. The, the the bottom of the box, the mystery of the demonic puppeteer. <laughs> oh, my God. That's like, <laughs> so it's you. so right up my alley. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I need to find out more. So it is adventure, adventure game as a horror, obviously. Uh, area movement, dice rolling, and it's a storytelling game. And it's a game for one to, one to five and uh one to five players and, and basically you're you're a group of kids <laughs> and this group of kids is called the pizza investigation like it's so cute it's cute but then it's like horror driven stories so it's really interesting but I, I do like the fact that it is a storytelling with that theme so I'm, I'm i'm interested in delving a bit more to see how the story develops i know it's kind of in left field from all the other games but hey that's why we play gaming we play lots of different things for sure um the artemis project is a kickstarter and it's interesting how many of these games have been on kickstarter honestly as i'm looking at this list uh forense the reprint was kickstarted escape plan on i don't know if i'm on tour was dino world was yes um fantastic factories was Mm -hmm. there's a lot i mean this is a lot there's a lot Uh, the artemis project uh was on kickstarter and i think this is grand gamers guild and it's it's got a lot going on i really love this concept of above 
like on the Arctic and underwater and all this other kind of stuff. It just looks intriguing, a nice kind of medium weight game that I can sink my teeth into with a fun theme, an interesting theme. Uh, so I'm excited for that one. Oh, and I've seen it around, but it's not one that I played. So if you end up getting, I would love to to try that. For sure. So the next game I'm going to talk about, oh boy, here we go. It's called Vien. And uh, it's actually spelled V-E-J-E-N. So if I am pronouncing that incorrectly, please feel free to <laughs> forward the correct pronunciation because I did look it up and we had a few different versions. I was going to say, oh, you looked it up. I just want to point out before we started recording, <laughs> Mandy spent a, a number of minutes uh, researching exactly how to pronounce his name. So if you are going to correct her, just be aware. <laughs> this woman put a lot of effort into getting it right. <laughs> So if I'm wrong, I'm going to be crushed, but I I, I appreciate the correction. <laughs> so uh, in uh, Vienne, and it's uh, a publisher I'm not familiar with, Spielfable? Spielfable? I want to say it like it's French, so I'm trying not to, but um, it's not a publisher I'm aware of. So this was a, that was new to me. And uh, it's a medieval, I guess, is the, the, the way they have it categorized, pick up and deliver, root network building and trading. Uh, and it's uh, supposed to be uh, villages in Denmark and Germany. And you're trying to set up these trading houses, um, upgrade your cards, buy goods, travel distances, and resell your goods. And then they have, it happens through a variety of phases in order for you to do that. So it actually isn't one that I had ever heard of. I don't know if this was on Kickstarter or this is just one. I don't think it is. I think it's a one that was just has come out through the publisher. Correct. I could be wrong about that. Someone I'm sure will let me know. But it seems interesting. I mean, it's it's definitely in the realm of games that I like. And it is on the weightier side at about a 3.5 on BGG. So definitely looking forward forward to trying that out all right well i think the last one i have on my list for now i'm sure that oh my gosh there'll be a lot more space gate odyssey from ludonaut um designed by cedric lefebvre and first of all space gate odyssey pretty obvious it's some kind of sci-fi game right Mm -hmm. um but hello art from vincent dutre Oh, yeah. I love it. I love, 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 love it when Vincent goes outside of kind of the traditional European settings and does something a little more sci-fi. Uh, Vincent did um, the Rising Five art. Yep. It's very nice. And I absolutely adored it there. And that is absolutely the first thing that caught my eye was the, the cover art. Uh, and then I looked into it and it's basically a tile laying game. The components look really interesting. They're different kind of plantoid shapes and there's spaces for pieces on them. And there's some kind of pathing. It looks like I honestly, I think it's about planets and space gates. I don't know much more beyond that, to be honest, but it's got tile lane route building and Vincent Dutre art from Ludonaut, which is a publisher I typically like. So, a hundred percent looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's it's spacey, so I don't know, but I'm willing to give it a shot. Well, and the the designer, for what it's worth, is the same designer of Yggdrasil, which is a very yep yep. You know, it's a cooperative game, which isn't always my thing, but it's definitely some design cred here too. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. So, and the art sounds well, fantastic. So, the last one on my list is Endangered. And I'm going to tell you, I know nothing about this game. I literally just saw the box cover, saw that it was, the art was, I mean, Ben Flores and Beth Sobel. So anybody who's heard me talk, if Beth Sobel's touched it, well, you know, I'm you definitely need to have it. And it has this tiger on the front. It's so beautiful. And then I'm scrolling through, looking at it, and they have these pictures of these two otters. And I'm like, oh, just for that, <laughs> I want this game. So obviously it's an animal game cooperative. So I don't know um, if you're not a cooperative games person, this may not be for you, but something to look at it and it has dice. And I think, like I said, I actually don't know too much. I think it has to do with um, basically the survival of species and you're trying to prevent them from becoming extinct and you want to stop that. So, I mean, I love that message. If that's what it's about, I'd like to see how it's conveyed through the game, but the art alone has got me. um, So that's endangered. That sounds cool. Very, yeah, Beth, I love Beth. Sorry. I know, she's fantastic. And I mean, that was, we actually went through a ton of games and I know this episode's running a little bit long. Thank you everybody who stuck with us and kind of put up with us through all this. But I'm excited for 2019, 2018. Thomas said it many, many times. I'm excited. 2018 was a great year in gaming. It really and was. I think 2019 looks really interesting. I'm excited to see how it falls out. And with all things, we haven't even heard about or gotten a hint about games that are coming out later in the year. Yep. But just for kind of the kickoff for the year, I'm I'm thinking it looks pretty cool. But hey, 
as always, we're going to miss things. There's so many games coming out every year. It's impossible for us to keep up on everyone. So if you think we missed one that you think we're interested in, feel free to drop us an email because we got to put our shopping list together. Yes. And now that we're going to be back kind of on track, we got to get our Q&A rolling again, including for our live YouTube Q&As. So feel free to drop us any questions. Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And Mandy, that's Mandy with an I at Dicetower.com. As always, thank you so much for listening and joining us here. It's always an honor and privilege to get to podcast about games with you. Um, don't forget, of course, that Kickstarter is out there. If you want to take a look and get some cool promos or just kind of support the Dice Tower for the content, the vast video and audio content that the Dice Tower puts out every year, feel free to take a look at that. Um, but next episode is episode 592. And Tom and Eric will be back. They've kind of been doing this great going back in time thing. <laughs> Gotta go back to in again. time. Back there we go. in time. Sorry. Okay, we're done. I was we're late. Done. I was late. <laughs> uh, so they're going back 15 years to talk about their favorites from 2004. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Until next time, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Basil Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackbasil.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Itai Perez, Roy Canaday, Rob Searing, and Jeff Rademacher. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, it is that time. Two truths and a lie. So let's do our reveal from the last episode. So I'll start with mine. I can break dance. I studied ballet. And I can tap dance. So if you said that I can break dance, you would be right that that is the lie. I'm sure I could try it and probably be decent at it. But no, I do not do the break dancing. <laughs> You, you, you could try it and be decent at it, huh, Mandy? I feel like you need to prove this statement in public while I'm recording it. I just, I feel like that needs to happen. I'm like literally popping and locking right now as we're having this conversation. Oh, yeah, we definitely have to do this in public because that is, <laughs> that is a thing that I just witnessed, people. Ooh. It's something. <laughs> All right, my reveal from last episode. I like cherry Coke. I like lime Coke. I like vanilla Coke. The lie is... I like vanilla Coke. Vanilla Coke is <laughs> no, thank you. Not a no, just in general. I was trying to find an excuse for it, but no. What I really like is mixing <laughs> cherry Coke and lime Coke to get cherry lime Coke. Mwah, delish. This is so interesting because I don't drink Coke, so it's like they all taste the same to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> falsehoods. I'm sorry. Oh boy. So now moving into our new two truths and a lie, I will start us off, and I think I've got some fun ones. I love the 1960s animated series Hercules. I love the animated series Super Friends. And I love the animated series The Littles. Mm, I love that show. Okay. <laughs> I had to, I, just so you know, I had to stop myself from singing all of the theme songs there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. New this episode. I saw Forrest Gump seven times in the theater. I saw The Lion King seven times in the theater. And I saw Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion seven times in the theater. That is a lot of movie time. We'll see.
All right, everyone. Good luck. Thanks to our sponsors at Renegade Game Studios. You can learn more about Raycult and all Renegade games at renegadegames.com.